Hey, everybody. Look, I know there are so many competing interests here at the World Economic Forum, so many brilliant panels. So it's so lovely you could all come up to Aspen 3 uh, and come and join what I think is going to be a brilliant chat as well. I am stunningly passionate about the food I eat and where I get it from uh, and what it means to the communities um, that create that food. And this magnificent panel, a large number of them, are the people in between me uh, and those producers. But we need to improve things, don't we? I mean, I'm just back from Dubai. It's a little bit hotter there as well. And I did not spend 30% of my time talking about food. I spent probably 50, 60% of my time talking about energy. It's great. We need to talk about that. But some of the stats, which you may or may not have paid attention to, I'm not going to test you all, so I'll give you a little bit of a run through of what we just saw on the video as well. The First Mover Coalition for Food. This is a brilliant initiative as well. Just building on the First Mover Coalition. Um, uh, work that the World Economic Forum has done in, in various sectors as well. Um, the 1st of December in Dubai, 20 plus corporates got together um, to work with partners such as research partners, corporations, UAE government backing this as well. Uh, I've had to change one thing on my notes already because from 20 plus, Daniel, correct me here, I think it's 30 plus now. We're 30 plus on this one, so it's pretty impressive. And what is the aim? I think you know that, that's why you're here, it's to accelerate sustainable farming and production methods and technologies, leverage collective demand. Look at the power of three, these three companies, plus we've got a philanthropist on board as well, but the power of just these three alone. We're talking about an industry that has literally trillions of dollars worth of revenues. Look what that industry can do by sending the right demand and procurement signals as well. So through the power of aggregate demand, we're looking for a low base, 10 to $20 billion worth uh, of combined procurement from coalition members. That should be very attainable. PepsiCo could do it on their own. <laughs> you, can, you can see where this one's going, can't you? Poor Ramon. He worked we with me last year, he's only just got over it. We're, we're flipping. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get me on the others. I mean, I can do this all day. Uh, right, it shouldn't be too hard, should it, as well? Out of a combined revenue globally of 2.1 trillion as well. Founding members, leading food companies uh, who see the need for more sustainable practices and innovations in food production systems. Now, since December, participants participants have been looking at identifying and shaping the new pathways to support and mobilize demand uh, and get that transformation going as well. Um, the initial results, I think, are going to be published later this year, middle of the year, 2024. So we're hoping for something there. About the same time that Madame Lagarde told us that we might get a rate cut. So who knows if that's a coincidence. Right, so I go for the numbers again. They're devastating. You should have seen them on the panel, on, on the board there. I think you know it. That's why you're here anyway. I'll just go through it one more time. Food systems. 30% of greenhouse gases does not get 30% of the attention. Megan knows about this. It doesn't get 30% of the philanthropy. It doesn't get 30% of the money. But wow, think what we can do. 30% of greenhouse gases receive less than 4% of climate financing. How about that for an imbalance? 70% of global agricultural food systems, GHGs come from just six commodities. Gilberto will move on to that. Beef cattle, dairy, rice, row crops, soy, palm oil as well count for over 70% of freshwater usage. Water. We need to talk more about water. And we're running, you know, the, the, the glaciers are melting. I mean, there's so many that we need to be so conservative in our use of water, but we're not, are we? Uh, over 80% of all deforestation as well. Uh, the parties are going to give off a clear signal here today as well about the sizable demand signal for low carbon and nature positive agri-food commodities as well. The accelerate adoption of sustainable technology as well. Technology is there. I keep hearing it, whether it's in the seed science. We remember we talked about bio, with bio last year, about the seed science. The technology is there. The practices are there, the ways of doing this. It's just a question of the adoption at a bigger scale as well. Uh, new additions to the coalition as well. Um, unfortunately, uh, a representative from China, Myeng, you couldn't make it as well, but they're joining as well. AGRA, uh, the World Farmers Organization, and hot off the press, in fact, I don't think he's on the press yet, it's so hot off the press, is the World Food Programme, Cindy McCain giving a real endorsement to that as well, and I think it's somewhere in the region of a billion as well. So again, puts that 10 to $20 billion worth of revenue procurement in perspective. All right, Leo, I've spoken long enough. I'm hoping this amazing panel will spend a lot of time talking amongst themselves about the key issues as well. 
Ramon Laguata, he's a chairman and CEO of PepsiCo. By the way, I'm not going to do big descriptions. You can look up these, uh, ladies and gentlemen. You know who they are pretty much as well. Uh, Axton Salim is a director and uh, member of the board of Indo Food as well. Gilberto Tomazzoni is the global CEO of JBS. Nice to see you, sir, as well. Uh, and Megan Scarcella, who's the executive director of 1111 Foundation. We'll just come at this from a philanthropy angle as well. There, there's lots to say there as well. Ramon, I'm going to start off with you as well. The power of PepsiCo and the companies of the, your size it, it is quite extraordinary as well. You're a founder member uh, of the movement as well. Your team is actively working to shape the, uh, the, the policy of the Jeff Institute. Talk about the ultimate big picture goals for us. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Now, this, this is, I think it's fundamental to us, it's fundamental to, um, to PepsiCo as well. The, um, the, the food system, as you mentioned, has a, a lot of opportunities and, and it has a some big objectives. Now we need to feed f 8 billion people uh, with nutritious food in a way that we don't deplete resources of the planet. And then also very important, you didn't mention that uh, the farmer needs to earn very good living and we need to give farmers farming uh, as, as, a very, as a very critical uh, delivery of this transition. So, you know, we, we see ourselves, obviously you mentioned the scale, but it's not only the scale, it's also our our, uh, our values that drive this. Uh, if we want to have PepsiCo continue to be a high performing company, we are a $50 billion company plus our beverage business, we're over $90 billion. So we see us as a, as a critical actor in, in, in our decisions, but also as thought leaders of the broader ecosystem trying to uh, make this tra transition happening. And to me, there are two big actors in this transition. One is the farmer and the other one is the consumer. And we, we have the opportunity to impact both. Um, this coalition obviously is about giving the farmer uh, certainty uh, or a bit more certainty or, or reduce their risk in transforming the way they do agriculture and the way they've been doing agriculture for many years. And in this transition, there is a financial risk for them. Uh, so I think there is a, there's a technical uh, transfer of knowledge to them and there is some financial de-risking of this transformation that hopefully this coalition of uh, you know, large companies and medium-sized companies uh, with their purchasing power, the risks that transition for the farmer, which to me is the critical agent that we need to put at the center of this transition, understand his, their psychology, their finances, their technical knowledge, and the social elements that surround the, uh, the farmer. Um, I'm going to ask you uh, just to follow up on this as well, but it, it's not one of the questions I've already got queued. It's just listening to you speak. It's like we need to de-risk for the farmer as well. Why haven't we been doing that up till now? Why haven't the biggest procurers of food, the amazing companies we have here, plus the rest of the industry, what, what has the industry been, been getting wrong up to date? You kind of almost got to look in the mirror and say what you haven't been doing and what you need to do more of. I, I think you're, uh, the, the last, I would say, four or five years, the industry has um, pivoted to not only focusing on the growth, but the how of this growth. And I think uh, it, it's been a pivotal moment. You mentioned co-op. For the first time, we were able to put food at the center of a, the co-op discussions now. And we've been working on this for quite some time. The food, uh, the transformation of the food system is something we've been working for quite some time. But finally, we're putting this at the center of the governments, at the center of broader societal transformations, because I think it has, as you said, big impact on emissions, big impact of on, on water, big impact on the livelihoods of billions of people that if they don't produce food for us, and that's their main uh, responsibility, but also their, 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 their livelihoods, we're gonna be in a very difficult position um, 10 years from now, five years from now. So that, that, that is, uh, and, and I, I would say, I, I think we should um, aspire for more as a food industry, but also I think we should feel good about the progress that the food industry has uh, has made in the last four or five years to elevate the um, you know the, the importance of the food industry for transformation of of, uh, of society. Thank you. I've got plenty more questions, but I, I really want to just get round for a round first of all, and then and again, um, what I'm also going to do is I'm going to get the panel to speak to each other as well because I'm sure they're going to have some brilliant cross questioning as well for each other. Um, Gilberto, 
Um, the Brazilian government has taken over the December, in December, the rotating presidency of the G20. You've been nominated to lead the G20 Sustainable Food Systems Group. So we get you in two capacities here. So that's great as well. Really, really simple question. What are your key challenges? Not a simple answer. For sure, it's not a simple answer. <laughs> but I think is this uh, the good things that uh, food now is the center of the agenda. We see in, the, in, in this forum that uh, we are discussing a lot in terms of food security, food system. This is really important because, as you mentioned in the beginning, just 4% of the investment for climate change go to food. And food represents 30% of the, the emissions. But there is another side of this. Population keep growing. Will be more than 8 billion people in 2050. We need to feed this. And agriculture can be part of the solution because we can tackle the two problems at the same time. We, we need to increase the productivity of the farms. Today, 67% uh, of the farms live it in a poverty. Means that we need to invest in order to improve the life of the small holders, and at the same time, increase productivity because we need to feed the world. This is, this is one of the main drivers. We need to support the farmers to make a transition for more sustainable food. And it is not the methodology and the technology are available. It's now is, is a, a question of to speed up the process of Bring, bring this knowledge to the small holders and financials, the transitions, the insight, the first money, they start to move in because they don't have money to make the investment. We need to support them. And then it's a part, it's a private sector, it's a government, it's NGOs, it's a foundations. We need to join force because it's too big for one or other company or one government to, to talk together to, uh, alone this, this issue. But this is, this is the critical issue for humanity. We need to feed more population and we need to, to reduce the gas emissions. I think this is, for me, it's the most important thing is to put the farmers, to put the people at the center of the agenda. Because if we support them, we can tackle the two challenges at the same time. And the way is to increase productivity. OK, I'm going to go for it straight away. I was going to wait a little bit. Um, is this all about big industrial farmers creating the amount of food that the world needs? You talked about the extra billion people. Or actually, are smaller farm holders, stakeholders within this, are they welcome? Because I look at three enormous businesses here as well. It's easier for you to deal with the landowners and the farmers who are doing things on a bigger scale, on an industrial scale. You have one person to talk to where you might have 10, 20, 30 as well. What's the future for those smaller stakeholders if the pressure is going to carry on for those and the industry to have better productivity and to feed more mouths? But we have an example. I give you an example uh, from Brazil. We have, in terms of, we will talk about one of the chains, Carols. We have 95,000 suppliers of Carol in Brazil. You can say the number, the size of this. We, 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 we deal with the big ones and we did the small ones. And it, it, it's a, we can, we have an experience. We open 20, green office, we call green office, to support the small farmers to make the transitions, give the technology, and the way that they move to be some of, is not in a, in a compliance with the legislation, help them to be in compliance with the legislation. And it works so well, because we can, in the same area, to produce 40, double the production, and storage the carbon at the same time. It, 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 it's, it is not some, it's, I believe that is the, is this revigorate the small farmers, is the, it is this transition of our green, is the opportunity for revigorate the small farmers. Yeah. Um, 
I, I think... You want to come in? Yeah. I, we'll, we'll do this well, straight away, then. We'll know, come in, and then yeah. we'll get through to you, too. Yeah. I, I think, the, um, uh, as a global company, obviously, we have to adapt the how we do this transition to the realities of every, uh, you know, market. So, in the U.S., yes, there's a lot of, about uh, helping larger businesses move forward. So, it's more of a business discussion in that case. When you go to India, for example, in our we have a la very large potato uh, business in India. We have in the large tens of thousands of farmers. It's a very different way of uh, you know, moving them to the next stage. And it's this technical knowledge. We have demonstration farms where we share the knowledge. It's a very different way of financing their transition. You probably need the uh, uh, some sort of aggregation in form of cooperatives of other you know, other, other ways where they're organized above the uh, single uh, smallholder level, and that's where you deploy the knowledge, you deploy the financing, and then they organize. So the how it varies. I think the ultimate vision is that the full, the global industry moves forward with a whole set uh, of new practices. Why? Because it's financially better for the farmer to um, eventually, after they go through the transition, to farm with the new practices. Um, I'll come back to this. I think it's a key part of what a lot of us really care about as well. Megan, philanthropy has a role to play, but as you were telling me in the green room as well, I don't know if that bit was Chatham House or not, but I'll say it anyway. Uh, yeah. um, uh, I don't think it was. Um, it can't do it on its own. No, no, and thank you so much for that. I am so glad you brought up the notion that we need multi-stakeholder collaboration to address the climate issue. At 1111, our engagement with the forum is mostly in the Gaia initiative, which is essentially following the model of public-private philanthropic, philanthropic partnerships to address climate. Um, but we've also heard this statistic that is really troublesome to us, and we all know it, that 2% of philanthropy goes to address climate. But the reality is, even if 100% of philanthropy went to address climate, it would not be enough. You know, that's, that's maybe one trillion of a $5 trillion problem. So I just want to give accolades to my co-panelists here because you guys are stepping in as private sector um, needs to do. And, you know, we know public sector can create the enabling conditions. We know private sector can help the scalability. And in terms of philanthropy, you know, we are here to kind of shape shift and fill in the gaps where you might need them. And we also like to consider our role as the canary in the coal mine, so to speak, in terms of finding and funding the innovative climate tech that can if help I you. I mean, one area where I think there, there is probably uh, a great role for philanthropy is um, women in agriculture. Yeah. I think when, when we, and, and, and that by itself could be difficult for the private sector, although we're trying to enable females to uh, own land and, and farm, but I think there is a starting point where probably philanthropy can help. Yeah. And because we see a huge improvement in productivity in in every end-to-end -end value for ones women are in charge of the agriculture. So if I, if I, that to me is just a, like, if you can focus your money, that's 5%, do it against that. To, I, I think you make a huge difference. Appreciate that insight. Would you also say a gap to, to you know, helping to support women in agriculture, uh, obviously financial gap, right? So financial resources as a solution to get them access to capital to yeah, yeah. Them. The, the whole package. Yeah. I think it's technology is breaking some of the social uh, bottlenecks yeah. in some countries, and then obviously giving them right to land and right to uh, um, you know initial capital to make the. Uh, the um, I think this is the more the initial capital. Yes. It's for me, initial capital is the key for that, because when you talk about the small farmers, some of them they have a monoculture. For example, just cattle. We need to go there to support them to have another uh, other culture. For example, to plant cocoa or something like that. They to enhance the revenue of them, reduce the, the leverage, the risk, the activity, because they have two corrupts. Yeah? And but they need initial capital. Yeah. They need to know how to learn that. That we need to work in multi multi collaboration. Today yeah. we have a JBS fund for Amazon and we are collaborating with Solidaridad. We are working together yeah. for 1.5 1, 1, thousand families 
we are support them to make the transition. Really small farmers. Let me let me jump in here. I'm, I'm pleased I lost control of this a little bit earlier than I expected. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which, is, which is absolutely fantastic because you've got to be careful what you wish for in this world, haven't you? And I did ask for free flowing, and my goodness me, I got it. I, actually, if you could be patient for one more second, um, no and, uh, because um, I just want to come back at you. Yeah. Philanthropy, this is why I've got my phone out, very rudely. To desire to promote the welfare of others expressed especially by the generous donation of money to good causes as well. I just looked up the de definition because I wanted to get it right as well. This has to be about philanthropy leading to economic rationale. Mm -hmm. This ain't going to work long, time, long term, you've already mentioned, mm -hmm. unless the business case is backed up after this initial seed capital. We're, we're setting the wheels in motion as well. So you're not looking and your sector is not looking at giving vast amounts of money ad infinitum as a good no. cause. It's looking at a, a setting in motion, and we talked about de-risking. That is absolutely going to be one of the key messages from this panel as well. De-risking yep. the investment as well. That You need to be there at the start, but you, don't, you want to kind of almost put the kid on the bike, yes. hold it with the stabilizers, yeah. and then watch it go. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I will say, obviously, we as a family foundation are not in the business of procuring commodities, um, but we are encouraging everyone in the corporate sector to consider business unusual because we are not living on a flat earth with infinite resources, as my friend Catherine Hayhoe likes to say. We have, you know, it's limited in scope, so we really need to start address addressing our business practices to reflect that. And I need to readdress something as well because this wonderfully patient man here <laughs> from uh, <laughs> from Indo Food, Axton Salim, is joining. Uh, just give us your own example. You guys do everything along the whole value chain as well. That gives you, with your mothership company as well, real insight. Just, just tell us about what you're doing and what the challenges are. I think uh, food security can be challenging in, in developing countries like Indonesia. So with that, I think uh, access to quality or, or uh, quality and sufficient food is, can be difficult in some of the some of the population. So with that, I think affordability is going to be key. So in any kind of innovations that we will be doing, one thing is we cannot have excess uh, additional costs towards the con consumers. I think that is the number one thing for, for me. And uh, for Indofood, I think we are, uh, we are a total food solutions company. We all the way from agriculture, agriculture all the way to manufacturing and distribution. So with that, I think uh, in addressing the challenges of the food system, I think one, one, one thing is we would like to promote the low carbon, low carbon initiatives throughout the value chain. So upstream, uh, manufacturing processes and also the downstream. So for upstream, I think what we do is we support the government's uh, projects for our agribusiness. Uh, we implement the agri agriculture practices which aligns with the government and to achieve the net sink for the forestry and land use by 2030. So which that, that is zero deforestation, zero new planting for peatland and zero burning for land clearing for any kind of replanting. And also, we also do preservation work for the high uh, conservation value uh, land areas around our, our, our uh, sites, which is about, right now, I think we have about 25,000 hectares uh, that is already being uh, uh, preserved. And also, 84% of our fertilizers are organic. So I think with that, you know, I think for, that's for the big agribusiness, you know, but for the smaller, smaller, uh, Farmers, what we have to think of before anything is actually, uh, as you said, you know, it's the livelihood and the, yeah. the of, the, of the farmers need to come first. So with that, I think uh, I think it's the same, the same examples. You know, I think we have uh, potato farmers in Indonesia. What we do is we provide good seeds. You know, teaching the farmers with good uh, agriculture practices, and with that, I think it's better yield, uh, lesser use of uh, fertilizers, and of course, I think better for the better income for the, for the uh, farmers. You've said and so much that's interesting there. Um, let me come back here, one absolutely pivotal point, then all jump in. I think this is going to be the key. <laughs> Price for the consumer. Yes. I, I get in a lot of trouble when I go to my local supermarket or my local farm shop if I don't buy organic. I've got to be brutally honest. Mrs. Sedgwick just comes back and says, we've got to buy organic, you know. We've got to go. Well, and, and, yeah, I pay more for it. And I should. I, I live in the rich Western world. Why shouldn't I? But we're not just talking about everyone not being... Some people can't pay more. Yes. Some people can pay more. Yep. How do we work around this as well? Because in order to give a fair price to the farmer, 
we have to pay more, don't we? Or, 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 or is that just a no-no? You were very unequivocal about that. You said, no, we cannot have the consumer having to pay more. I think it's more about uh, helping them to increase the yield and, get, and teaching them the, the good uh, agriculture practices. I think with that, uh, how, how we work is uh, if with, with the help in, that, in those areas, we actually do buy from the farmers as well. So I think that gives a, a kind of a, a protection against, against the, the pricing. In, in the market. But, but, but the battle... There but is a, go on, go on. Is, I think there is enough uh, data already that says that if you move a farmer from conventional farming practices to regenerative farming practices after a short period, which depending on the, uh, you know, the knowledge and, and you know, uh, some other two to three years, this farmer will have a better p &L, both in terms of higher yield and uh, lower cost, which then says, okay, it's not necessary if you think the aggregate price of agriculture will not have to go up because we'll have better yield. So I, I think w the, the problem to solve, and that's where we're all spending a lot of time, is the transition. And this transition happens one farmer at a time and is very local. So the, what we need to do in Indonesia yep. with the realities of the Indonesia uh, market structure is very different from Brazil or from Spain or whatever. But, but, but the, um, the out, I think the outcome is gonna be the same. There, there is, a, is a way of farming that uh, takes care of the soil that is, you know, it, it's, it's um, mindful of the uh, water resources, the amount of nutrition that we add to the soil. If we, yeah, and there's enough knowledge at this point and enough data point that I think this is investable now. So as part of this coalition, we need to bring banks, we need to bring insurance companies mm -hmm. into helping finance this transition. We don't need philanthropy anymore, I think. So that, there is enough knowledge to, to, get, yeah. to get that as an investable asset. And, and I think we're, we're there. We're, it's only a question of time, but we're, we're very optimistic. In, in my opinion, a consumer not willing to pay more for a sustainable product. Could be a niche. Sorry, a sustainable quality, product, product I, I, I'll say, no, I say low carbon, low carbon uh, emissions, because, because we need not forget that one third of the population today not to eat. If we, if we believe that we can make this transition to increase the price of the product, the product will become less affordable. This is not the solution. But doesn't a better quality product have better nutrition? But, 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 but yes. Yes, but look, it, it, the, cons the consumers can make it a preference for this product, but not willing to pay more. This, the solution is to increase the productivity, to productivity of the farm. Is it possible with what uh, I mentioned here, uh, like Arthur mentioned, we, we know that regenerative practice will be increased productivity. If you increase the productivity, we reduce the cost at the end. And then, in addition, you can, you can attract capital for, for, uh, from, from, the, from the market, for example, for carbon market. Yeah. That we can enhance the revenue and to, to re reduce the cost of the production. I believe in that. We need to work to, the key word is improve productivity. Yeah. I think if you... And then Megan come in. Yeah, Megan, Megan come in, then Ramon. Oh, just real quick, if I'm hearing you correctly, you're saying that the responsibility of the um, increased cost of the, of the goods should be on the shoulders of the producer in terms of making sure that you get to increase productivity to reduce that cost. Yeah, I would say that we need to bring new way to produce yep. from the farmers that these this, the output will be higher output that reduce the cost. What we need to be that to, to bring knowledge and initial financials mm -hmm. from the make the start the transitions. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. No, I, would, I was going to say, I think, I think what, what uh, Liberto said is, is true. I think mainstream brands, I don't think they'll be able to uh, convey premium for the sake of just having better 
farming practices. I don't think so. Yeah. So we shouldn't assume that Lay's or Quaker or some of our large brands will be able to carry that premium. We can create premium brands that might be able to carry some premium. Mm. So what your wife probably can afford, but well, not, not what the majority <laughs> of the people can afford. Whether she can afford it or not is but, a different equation yeah, whether I, I can afford it or not. You can afford. <laughs> but but, but I, I wish we shouldn't make the business case based on we're gonna premiumize. I think we, I think we can create some loyalty to our brands. That's the yes. business case probably commercially and how we should approach it, but the, 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 the you know, the consequence of that is I think we need to make sure that the farming is more productive and I think that we have enough data to support. Now, how do we bring money into the farming system to, gener to, f to finance the transition? Yeah. One of the things we're trying to do with this coalition is to bring certainty of demand, which hopefully can, and I, I'm hopeful that we can do that as a group, is to move the uh, horizon of procurement to multi-year. Right now, one of the bottlenecks yeah. is that we're buying or the system is buying mostly one year at a time. Yeah. So we don't give enough certainty to the farmer to, to execute a much more longer investment uh, that he needs to transform itself. Now, I think we need to give the farmer that visibility and that certainty mm -hmm. and that, that will provide, you know, he will be able to invest, go through that, that valley and then get to the peak. I think that's one of the objectives of this group is not only to buy more, but is to buy in a different way so that we can enable this transition. It's one of the elements. Yeah, yeah I think we are, I think on this panel, I think we're focusing a lot on the agriculture and the farming side of the carbon reduction. But if we look at the whole food manufacturing, it goes all the way, you know, from, from the farming side all the way to the distribution side of it. So if we look at it, how can we improve the other parts of the uh, uh, food manufacturing value chain, value uh, chain on that? So I think from us, I think one of the examples is how we actually utilize uh, the renewable energy for our manufacturing purposes. About 70% right now of our manufacturing in and of food is uh, using uh, biomass or PV. So I think with that, we can, we can definitely uh, take a look from a different uh, viewpoint not only from farming, but how we can look at it from the total. Yeah, uh, absolutely, and, and that ticks a lot of boxes on the, the initial figures we mentioned about greenhouse gases as well. Yep. But, but I'm, I, I unashamedly, I'm gonna concentrate on, 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 the, on the food, the price, the quality of it as well. Look, I, I, we, we're talking about part, you, the big brands can't increase the cost as well. I wanna go back a second, and, look, right. and I know this is, the, I can't increase, increase the price, and this is very specific, and, and it's just because it's a recent example, and everyone in this room is probably aware of the fact that you, your company has just had a major spat with a major French supermarket as well. It was about one part of the food chain having a, a row about price, I think, but ultimately, with another part of the food chain. It wasn't necessarily the consumer or the farmer who was getting involved in this one as well. It was about slicing and dicing along the chain with the, the farmer and the consumer, just bystanders as well. That's a great shame, isn't it, that two massive corporations were involved in this kind of conversation when actually, ultimately, it's the farmer that we need to improve the margins for. I don't think it's one or the other. I think it's a, uh, you know, as you were saying, it's a full value chain. Uh, we are genuinely committed to the transformation of the uh, agriculture and we're supporting the farmer mm. with our own uh, resources at this point because we need to create this, this positive momentum. So like in some farmers in Midwest of the US, we're paying $40 per acre more for having regenerative agriculture. So that, that's one thing. The other thing is how do we resolve commercial tensions with our customers, which is something that has been going on but since ever. the Middle Ages. I, I get that, so I get that. Middle Ages now that. becomes public yeah. because you guys spread the word. Well, so now, now how do we... Currently that is the know, job of the media, so that, I just say that. That's a different problem to solve. But, but Actually, how, I think it was Cup <laughs> that spread the word, not us. Probably, but yeah, <laughs> I'm just kidding, but you know. So, the fact that it became public is a reality. There's commercial tensions with suppliers, with, with the customers, yeah. and that's nature of doing business. And we do it in a very fair way and trying to but be what a win-win. I... Now, again, to, to your point, which I think is critical, is are we trying to take advantage of the farmer? Mm. No, I think it's the opposite. What we're it's trying opposite. to do is to help the farmer in what is a, an unknown journey that he's starting, because he needs to trust us that at the end of that journey, so it's a tunnel, at the end of the tunnel, you'll be more profitable, you'll have better livelihood for your family. Mm. That is the journey. Now, 
we're not going to do it the same in a large country, in a small country, medium-sized country. This is very local. It's micro. It's one farmer at a time. It's a community at a time, uh, putting the right solutions end to end, and, and that's where we're here. Now, the way we were solving this so far is vertical. So I was solving for the potato problem, for the corn problem, for the uh, uh, oat problem. Now we're trying to, uh, as we join forces, we're going to solve it for the farmer. Why? Because he has multiple crops. He rotates. He creates, you know, creates yeah. value by rotating. So if I combine the purchases with, with uh, Salim or with, uh, you know, with my colleague here, we give him a solution end to end. And that's what we're trying to do. So long term, full ecosystem, genuinely helping the farmer to go from this yeah. current knowledge to the future knowledge in a better business. And that's, that's an absolutely that's fair answer. And I'm, I'm not, as I say, you all know I'm not a gotcha, but I kind of want to make sure that, that, we're, 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 that when one big corporation has, as you say, it's been going on since the middle ages, when one big corporation in the food chain has a big argument with another big corporation in the food chain and it becomes very public, Again, it's our job to report on that as well, and perhaps one part of that food chain, maybe a French supermarket is making a big point about it. The fact is, I want to make sure the little guy that we're trying to actually improve the world for here isn't the one who suffers, because at the end of the day, the two big corporations don't turn around and say, well, I'm not going to lose my margin. I'm not going to lose my margin. Let's take it out on the farmer, because really? the farmer hasn't got it's a choice. A that, that, that's, I think, it's a fair absolutely got to be the concern. Did you want to come in, Megan? I, I just wanted to applaud the point you made in terms of recognizing the transition that these smallholder farmers will be having to endure when you go to regenerative agri agriculture. I mean, this is, they're operating on a legacy of farming practices that they now have to change. And, you know, we need to give them support and obviously patience. So, yeah. in, in reality, uh, the, the big corporations now, they are taking the, the initiatives to go to support the farms. And you need to now bring more stakeholders to help us. Because look for us, we have, we create a, a, a fund for Amazon just to support the small farms. Hmm. It's not at our, in our value chain. Hmm. They are not in our value chain, it's not our, our supplier, but we support them because we need to, to improve the life of the population there. If we want to, read, if you don't do emissions, we need to go, go a large way that, and this we need more stakeholders to join, like foundations, like on the NGOs, that the government. We need more play, more actors to help to make this transformation. Mm -hmm. and, and I just want to add one thing about the price that you mentioned here. Yeah, look for because that is innovations in agriculture as well. We. Everybody knows that about the, the challenge that you, we have in terms of enteric fermentation of cattle. Mm. We are work for three years in supplements to try to reduce the amount of the emissions. Yeah. The main challenge in the beginning, I will talk about three years, in the beginning was the cost of the supplement. They reduce the emissions, but they will increase a lot the cost of the meat. Now. We are quite there because we are now we are we are working a, in a big size of trial, mm. twenty thousand cows, and the the results we get from from uh, from the from the, the field now show that it's possible to reduce ninety percent of the methane emission and not increase the cost. This is the solution yeah. of the technology. I know. There's a gentleman not a million miles away from you who used to work for a company that was very big on this well and drummed it into me for a very long time. Nice to see you, Herman. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Axon, do you want to come in on this one? No, I, I, I truly believe that it needs collaborative efforts. You know, I think everything from starting from the government, you know, private sector and like civil society needs to come together, have a common understanding and not, not blame each other for, for yeah. whatever is uh, happening, you know, and just find the common and common solutions as well. I think that's going to be key. Look, already we've, already, we've got five minutes left, so let's just work on some... Uh, yeah, go on, uh, you go ahead. One, one point I think is relevant. You, you mentioned something that could be... It's not proven yet, but we're working on it, which is better soil delivers better nutrients. I think this could be a, a consumer unlock which you know, we haven't yet proven that this is true, but, but I think and we, but we have some... Well, we know that better food has better outcomes. We have some signals yeah. that might say that, that if unarguable. we're able to 
improve this, the health of the soil as we are trying to do with exactly. you know and much more nutrients natural nutrients and better water uh, um, you know how it stays in, on the land and so on this will deliver better nutrients i think then we have a consumer story that might create the resources to to give more a livelihood to uh, a better livelihood For to sure. farmers so that that is a connection that still is it's scientific not a big leap I've, I've read so much food nutrition literature far over the last few years honestly tanya didn't get me in here without making me read 20 odd books but but, the, but well maybe she did but but the truth of the matter is we know there is a link between better nutrition better diet better health outcomes less cost it may, for the planet, less cost for governments, less cost for your health service, less insurance costs. You have better health costs. It's not about living to 80. It's about living better to 80. Better health outcomes on cancer, on heart disease, on diabetes, on cholesterol, yeah. by eating better food. So the cost there is obvious for the, the governments who have to raise less taxes because we have better outcomes because we're eating better food. It's so wonderfully beautiful. We've got to move on. How long have we got? Three minutes. Uh, ish. <laughs> <laughs> okay, give me some give me some achievables from this um, this coalition as well. What what if we, we okay we, we're going to be here in five ten years time? I'll still be here. Give me some outcomes that is going to that this is really going to work and, and 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 how we get there as well. We've mentioned financing. We've mentioned getting collaboration. We've mentioned um, working with the farmers as well, giving them investment, de risking de risking their decisions. Give me some more I, I, ideas I, I and some to outcomes. To be one, a one critical KPI. Uh, of this full transformation. You've got to call for a key performance indicator. It's, no, it's, it's, it's make sure the farmers have better living than they have today. Yeah. Because without the farmers making their living sustainably, they're going to walk away from farming. And that's the biggest risk. Right? The biggest risk we have is that the next generation of farmers don't want to farm. Yeah. Because they don't make a living or it's not Am I right fancy in saying the age of farmers is getting older it's around getting the world? Older, like, all of us are getting older, but but you know, but but it's but it's <laughs> it's it's a fact. So I think to me, a key KPI of this transformation, of course, is about feeding the, the world and is using less resources and everything else. We need to put the farmer at the center, and the farmer needs to have sustainable living, a better P and L, uh, you know, better asset, and that will justify the future generations staying in farming. It's a huge, huge enabler of of, of having enough food for everybody. Gilberto. And I, I totally agree that this, uh, this uh, because at the end we need to we need to tackle the two problems that we I mentioned before the the GNG emissions 30 percent of agriculture in the same time you need to produce more and to produce more and to tackle the problem you need to improve the life of the farms and for me this is the key point we need to put the people. Farmers at the center. People is the solution. And we know how to do. It's just you need to accelerate the technique we know today, the model that we have today, how we can speed up the process. Because we know there is existing good experience all of the world. Hey, the government needs to focus more. Just 4% of the investment go. If we change this, for four, for for four, for to forty percent, you can mention how can make we can change the. the I, I'm, I'm so tired. I've literally got twenty seconds for this answer. Uh, COP thirty is in Brazil, yeah. Brazil, and he's the guy. And you're the man on the. Co <laughs> so you need you need to get this even more front and centre. Yeah, no pressure. Sorry, see again. You're going to get agriculture and food systems right to the centre of COP thirty. E yeah, exactly. You'll be the centre. I'll be in Pará. So hold you to that. You'll be in Pará. In, yeah. In Pará, you'll be one of the most. In, uh, important uh, state in Brazil, and by the, by the way, the government of Pará take a decision to make a, uh, uh, a law, an obligation to have all of the cattle produced in Pará to be an electronic tag. Yeah. Okay. Megan. Real quick, we are at an all-hands-on-deck moment with the climate crisis. Yes, so no. my vision would be that you all have created a demand signal to big corporates to get on board with this idea of a uh, sustainably minded business first. And that would be, that would get us where we need to go. All hands on deck, couldn't All agree more. Axton. I mean, starting, starting point or before the KPI, I think understanding the whole supply chain, understanding what are the different KPIs that need to be 
for each. I think today we focus a lot on the agriculture and the, and the farming side, but there's a lot more of the different sites in the food manufacturing uh, yeah. value chain that yeah. needs to be understood. But all three of these enormous corporations here as well, as well. We'll, we'll hold you all to it, I can assure you as well. Uh, love the conversation, can't believe 45 minutes went so quickly as well. Um, in no particular order, Ramon Laguata, always a pleasure, sir. Thank you very much indeed for taking all my points, taking it in good spirit as well. Gilberto Tomazzini, Tomazzoni, I beg your pardon. I'm so looking forward to seeing your name in the press over the next couple of years and what you're pushing forward to. Absolutely <laughs> loads of pressure. I was going to say no pressure, loads of pressure. <laughs> Megan, it's lovely to see you. Megan Scarcella, thank you so much indeed as well. And Axton Salem, you are thank so you. right. The whole value chain, we need to look at that as well. Um, a round of applause for our brilliant panel. <laughs>